Hi everybody. Um, this video is kind of uh, coming late at night. Uh, we've had a long day, my wife and I, Angel, uh, and I've had a kind of a long day. We spent some time doing some yard work and cooking outside and things like that. And uh, it, won't, it won't be long and we'll be going to bed. But uh, I just wanted to, to share some things that have been on both of our hearts lately. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with uh, what's going on in, in, in the world as, you know, related to everybody. You know, right now we've got a lot of uh, hysteria uh, related to a virus. There's a lot of anger and violence uh, related to a man who was killed by the police not long ago. Uh, and, th and this doesn't have anything to do with those kinds of issues, those social issues that we're going through. Um, this is this is not related to those. Uh, it's my firm conviction that um, really for the believer, for the, the one who says he follows Christ and he has a uh, faith in God, um, the social issues that we should be involved in are related to other believers uh, and scripture speaks plenty uh, about justice and, and, and fairness and those kinds of things as it relates to those within the, the community of faith or those within the covenant um, but uh, I think many times we get really distracted by those things that go on around us uh, politics and socioeconomic uh, issues that relate to uh, the masses, to everybody in general, uh, unbelievers included. And we get all wrapped up in, in, in what everybody thinks and uh, those kinds of things. But this is not related to that. Um, this is related to uh, how we go about living a life of faith um, I think that's kind of what people get distracted from. They, they lose sight of the reality that we're supposed to be living a life of faith, not a life of hysteria and uh, not a life of anger and violence and all these kinds of things. And a lot of people, a lot of believers, they wonder what is faith and how do we live a life of faith Many questions come around from people who are generally, genuinely seeking answers. And unfortunately, the answers that many times we get, it relates to just single moments. Um, you know, big prayer requests. Maybe somebody wants to see their grandmother healed uh, of some kind of a, a disease or cancer or something like that. And when we talk about having faith, uh, that can move a mountain, uh, and the Bible does speak to that kind of a faith that where we have a big, strong request, and we want to have something, uh, we want to have God come and intervene for us on our behalf, and those kinds of things, but the Bible speaks more about a life of faith, uh, just walking all the way from the beginning to the end, believing God, and there's something about that that many believers don't get. Whether when they're asking for answers, they don't get those answers that they need. Or when they're reading the scriptures, they maybe gloss over and they don't get from the scriptures what they need because maybe they're not looking for some particular ingredient that they need in order to bring this whole thing together. So that's what I want to look at today. Uh, and when we look in scripture for examples of faith, I think you'll be hard pressed to find uh, anybody who's mentioned more than Abraham. Uh, he's called the father of our faith and uh, we're children of Abraham. Uh, even though we're children of God, it says we're, the Bible says we're children of Abraham uh, through faith. So, I want to look at some things that Abraham went through in his uh, 
in his walk of faith, in his life of faith. Uh, and the Bible gives us a few snippets and maybe we need to go back through and look at quite a bit that is mentioned of him so that we can kind of connect the dots instead of having a, a bunch of disconnected uh, uh, examples of what Abraham went through and how he had faith, we can uh, get a picture of his whole life of faith, at least a, a, a good part of his life, the one, the part of the, his life that involved him believing God and walking in that faith. So before we get into the scriptures, I want to pray. Um, Father, I thank you that, uh, that you've uh, put on my heart and that you've put on Angel's heart uh, for us to make a presentation. Um, and I pray that you will just guide me through the scriptures as I as I look and discuss uh, some of those things. And I, I pray for the people who are watching that maybe even if it's only one person, that somebody who's watching will will be able to take something away from this and maybe they will have a faith uh, that they never had before or maybe they'll grow in a faith that they've had before but they don't know how to walk in it. And Father, I ask that you uh, bless the words that come out of my mouth um, and help it to be fruitful for someone. And uh, we, we pray above, and, uh, above all else that you will receive glory and honor uh, through the words that are spoken. And uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I want to look first at one scripture that mentions Abraham. And there's a... It's in Romans chapter 4. And the Apostle Paul was writing, and he mentions Abraham, and how there was a promise that was granted through faith. And I want to start in verse 13. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, so it may not match. If, if you want to uh, have your Bible and follow along with the Scriptures, um, the wording may not match exactly what you have. Maybe you have the New International Version or uh, maybe you have the English Standard Version and the words may not be exactly the same, uh, but uh, you can rest assured the message is still the same even if the exact words aren't exactly the same. So I'll start in, in Romans 4, in verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. That's just there to... Uh, uh, I read that part just to let let you see that the context here is about Abraham. It says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, already dead since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, 
he was able also to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. That was Romans 4, 17 to 22. And there's something here in verse, or, or verse 13 to 22, but I wanted to really start in verse 17 There's something here that a lot of people miss when they read this passage. And this kind of sets us up with where Abraham was at the time that Paul is recounting what he went through here. It says, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. This was the promise that God had made to Abraham. Paul goes on to say, In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And what he's saying here is that sometimes God will, will give a promise well before the fulfillment. And that's where the life of faith comes in. Now earlier I mentioned the faith that it takes to move a mountain when we have a big request that, toward God, that he will come and intervene for us or, or bless us in some way. But there's a different kind of faith, and this one is often missed. This is where the life of faith comes in. If you're a believer, Paul said in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. And there are a lot of people who take issue with the idea of, of ongoing revelation. And I understand where they're, where they're talking about. Uh, they say, you know, everything is in the Bible that we need. The Bible itself is sufficient for everything we need to have a life of faith. And while that may be true in one regard... There and, and, and going along with that, they will also say, we don't need ongoing revelation. And to a certain degree, they're correct. This Bible has everything in it that we need to learn what it's like to follow God. And this Bible has everything in it already that we need to know about Jesus Christ. And there will be no further revelation about Christ that comes apart from this scripture. That part I agree with. But the Holy Spirit reveals things to his children. And it's done in a little bit different way now than what it was before. God uh, would many times speak to people in, in visions and dreams. And though there's still some of that today, um, the primary way that God speaks to us right now uh, is through an impression from the Holy Spirit. Maybe we're reading scripture and he enlightens us and, and speaks to us and we have something on the inside of us that just that just grows with a conviction of some truth or something like that. Um, but God speaks to us. And God spoke to Abraham. And this is what Paul is talking about when he says that God gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. If you're a believer, God has... Uh, solidified in your in your mind and in your spirit certain things that he's promised he's made promises to you maybe you haven't recognized them but he's given promises to all of us and when we look at the example of Abraham there was something that was bigger than just what's mentioned by Paul here it says that he was promised that he would be the father of many nations. 
and that he is and that he would have a lot of descendants but then some of the things that 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 went on we may not be able to really see the connection right away okay in his his body was weak Romans 4:19 says he did not consider his own body who was already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. And this was related to him having uh, many descendants. Well, what I want to look at is back in Genesis and there were there was more than one time that God came and spoke to Abraham and made and reiterated uh, at least certain parts of this promise. When we go to Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, before his name was Abraham, he was called Abram. The Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and your father's house, to a land that I will show you, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 4 says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And his nephew Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran to go down to the land of Canaan where God had called him. Now Paul was mentioning a time when Abraham, when Abraham was 100 years old. So this is 25 years before that God first told him he's going to make Abraham into a great nation. And what, what does that mean? It means he's going to have a lot of descendants. Well, before he can have a lot of descendants, he's got to first have one. He's got to first have one child. So there are some things that, that Abraham went through, uh, but not just the descendants. God promised to him that he would have a great blessing. He would be a great nation. Not just a lot of descendants, not just a, a say, you know, 200 million uh, destitute people who are just descended from, from him. No, a, a great nation. Uh, that's one that would include riches uh, and, and, and stature and those kinds of things like that. Um, so there were some things that God was going to fulfill for Abraham. There were, there were many things wrapped up into this promise, not just the promise of descendants, but great wealth uh, and, a, and a name and stature and power and, and all these kinds of things that were going to be passed on from Abraham to his descendants. And what we only see in, in Romans 4 there that Paul is talking about, it's just the time when... Uh, Abraham and Sarah would would have a child, would have that first child who was needed to be uh, the spawn of a of a great uh, nation. And so Paul or, or Abraham departs and he goes out, and on the way there they they go through Egypt. And uh, they encounter something that uh, Abram was kind of expecting. We told his his wife that in 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 Genesis twelve one or twelve twelve. Abram said to his wife, because she was so beautiful, when they go down into Egypt. They're going to want his wife. And if they know that that's his wife, they're going to kill him and take her. So he said to, to his wife, Sarah, say that you're my sister. 
and it will be well for for me and then I'll live well he's looking uh, beyond he's looking at not just wanting to live just so that he can stay alive but he's looking at the promise of God that he's going to become a great nation with many descendants and it hadn't been fulfilled yet well, as the story progresses, Pharaoh took Sarah as his wife. And then God came to Pharaoh in a dream and said, that's somebody else's wife. And so Pharaoh came and he had already given uh, Abraham many riches uh, because of Sarah. When he came and he he had Abraham and Sarah and Lot all driven out with everything that they had received from Pharaoh. So there was uh, probably the beginning of the riches that, that God was going to be giving to uh, Abraham. When we see Abraham progress through, his, through this part of his life, he's, uh, he's in, he encounters war and uh, division with uh, his nephew Lot. Um, they go into a place where uh, they're sharing, he's sharing the land with his, with his nephew Lot. And both of them have livestock, both of them have herdsmen, and it turns out that there's not enough land there for all the animals, for all the herds. And so Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen are fighting among one another. Abraham says to Lot, it's not good that we're, that our herdsmen, are, you know, our hired help are fighting with one another. He said, how about we split up a little bit and I'll even make it uh, good for you. You pick the part that you want first and I'll take what's left. And so Lot looked around and he, he saw this area down by the Jordan River uh, so where Sodom and Gomorrah were and he saw that the grass was green and he said that's the part that I want so Abraham said that's fine and so he let Abra he let Lot take that part and God continued to bless Abraham uh, even though he didn't have the best part and everything that he encountered uh, became wealthy and, and prosperous and those kinds of things when we get over to Genesis 15 God comes and reiterates this promise again. But it's a little bit broader now. It's got a few more details in it. And we see in Genesis 15, 1 to 6, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Remember I said that God speaks to his children. Okay, And God spoke to Abraham on, on this day in a vision and he came and said do not be afraid Abram I am your shield your exceedingly great reward but Abram said Lord God what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus then Abram said look you have given me no offspring Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Now this is the second time it says this. The word of the Lord came to him saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then God brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven. And count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now God, right there, He's taken Abram to already to a place well beyond where he's at right now. Remember what Paul said in Romans 4, 17. 
The God is the one who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Many times, God will set in front of you something that's not going to happen right away. Just like he did with Abram. Abram was 75 to 80 years old at this time, probably around 80 years old at this time. And we know from continuing to read the scripture that that first child of his came when he was 100. So this was 20 to 25 years 25 years before that that God first started to make those promises to Abram and he reiterated it to him again probably about 20 years before uh, that first child came. Just like Paul said that God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And that's where the life of faith comes in. We have to be able to look beyond our circumstances and look to something that God has promised us that may be far off. Many times, we'll be just like Abraham. He didn't know when this was going to be fulfilled. And many times, God will set something in front of us and we don't know when it's going to be fulfilled. And the life of faith is to go through this walk looking not at what's there today, but looking beyond, all the way to the end, to the fulfillment of what God has promised. That's the life of faith. And all of those hurdles that we have to jump along the way, all those pitfalls that we have to maneuver along the way, that's the life of faith. And we, we jump forward a little bit and Abraham and Sarah kind of got a little bit wise and they thought they were going to uh, they thought they were going to be the ones who really uh, took it upon themselves to fulfill the idea that they were to fulfill this uh, uh, offspring and the descendants and those kinds of things Sarah got the idea that Abram should go into her concubine, Hagar, and have a child. And so Abraham did. He went and he laid with Hagar and uh, she became pregnant and she bore Ishmael. Well, it wasn't, uh, wasn't too long after that that uh, Sarah became jealous. Sarah didn't have any kids. She became a little bit jealous. And God told Abraham that Ishmael was not the one that he was talking about. When he said, you'll, you'll be the father of a great nation and your descendants will uh, number as many as the stars. That wasn't what God had in mind. And he told that to Abraham. He said, Sarah will have a child. Well, so this is and maybe an even bigger, uh, a bigger deal than what uh, Abraham or Sarah thought it would be. Because they were already they were already getting old. They were already past their their child bearing days. But God wasn't finished. God was taking Abraham into a place where he could look beyond where he's at today. Looking all the way to the end. And so it comes about that Sarah got pregnant. And she bore a son named Isaac. And that was the son. And it became clear that that was the son when uh, there was a there was a uh, there's a story in Genesis, I believe, in chapter 18, where uh, Ishmael and and Isaac are there, and uh, there's some maybe some making fun of Ishmael uh, to, toward Isaac and things and. So Sarah says that she wants 
Hagar and that boy, Ishmael, driven out. And she tells to Abraham, this boy, Ishmael, will not be an heir with my son. Okay, she was kind of laying down an ultimatum. And God said to Abraham, do whatever she desires. And God was making it very clear right there that Isaac was the one. Isaac was the heir, and he was the one through whom uh, Abraham's descendants would be named and numbered. This is a time where Abraham is going to be waiting for Isaac to have kids. And there are, there's an account that we see where God tells Abraham to go and sacrifice his son, Isaac. And so they gather up a bunch of lumber, a bunch of wood, and they go up on a mountain for this sacrifice. This is in Genesis 22, and I'll just read some of this. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And see, God is... Talking to Abraham again. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now this is a test of faith for Abraham because God's telling him to sacrifice the one who's his heir, the one who's going to be instrumental in, in making Abraham into a, a great nation with many descendants. If, he, if, if, if Isaac dies, then, and then there's, no, uh, there's no chance for him to be able to have uh, children. And that means the promise of God that uh, Abraham that Abraham's going to have many descendants, and that his descendants are, his descendants are going to be coming through Isaac. All that is just hot air. All that's just wasted. And so many people would probably be confused by something like that. God made a promise that was still far off, and it hadn't been fulfilled yet. And then suddenly 